My name's Joan, I'm your games mistress, and here's a little bit about the difference between board games and card games. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you may have noticed that I usually refer to them as tabletop games, rather than calling them board games like they do on most other channels. That's probably because I take a bit more joy than they do in being pedantic, but um, it's partly based in truth, right? I mean, a lot of the games that I talk about here don't involve a board, so those can't possibly be board games. They must be something else. Right? Now, you could say that this is just pedantry, but when I'm working at the cafe and making game recommendations for people who want to try something a little new, I kind of need to have some idea of the difference between board games and card games, at least in the public imagination, because often people will say stuff like, we want something that's like, you know, a card game. You know, I mean, we don't really want a board game. Or sometimes they'll say, well, we want something that's like a board game, you know? I mean, we don't really want a card game. And yes, on the surface, this seems pretty simple. All I have to do is recommend card games for the first group and board games for the second group, right? But problem is, people often have really divergent ideas about what exactly a board game is, or what a card game is, and if you don't believe me, riddle me this. Is Monopoly a card game? I mean, it's got all these cards in it. Cribbage is a board, so it's gotta be a board game, right? If we're gonna talk about board games and card games as two distinct things that people can like or dislike, we're going to need a definition that actually works and is consistent, so how do we get that? Well, one way would be to figure out what's the main thing that you use in the game, what physical objects are most central to the play. But how do we decide that? I mean, take Clue, for example. In Clue, or um, Cluedo, as our friends across the Atlantic originally called it when they made it up, you roll dice to move your little playing piece around the board, and you use cards to keep track of what you've learned about the case so far. Then, if you think you've solved it, you move your piece over to the room where it happened and see if you got it right. So, okay, question. What's the most important thing in Clue, the board or the cards? I mean, is it 60% cards and 40% board? And what do those percentages even mean? How are we supposed to really measure the relative importance of these different components when you can't play the game unless you've got all of them? I don't want to get all defeatist this early in the video, but I don't think we can, not in any meaningful, useful way. This whole distinction between board game and card game is really a throwback to the Victorian era that doesn't make sense anymore in a world where Monopoly and Risk and Clue and Trivial Pursuit exist. Even though the cards are essential to the game of Clue, we can't really call it a card game, and even though it's played on a board, it's not exactly a board game either. So what is it then? Answer: Clue is a deduction game. Here's where I come to the point. If you ever want to talk about different kinds of games and why different kinds of people have fun playing them, you need to be able to divide games into categories, but if you divide them based on the components that you use to play them, you won't ever really be able to get the truth of this because those components are not really the soul of that kind of game. They're not what makes it different from another kind of game. They are necessary for playing it, but when you're actually there at the table, it's the way you use those components to interact with the game and with your fellow players that makes your experience playing that kind of game different from what your experience would be playing some other kind of game. Let's go back to Clue. What's going on in that game? There's been a crime. You have to figure out who did it, where did they do it, and how did they do it. And you go about this by process of elimination using deductive reasoning. You ask questions, you listen and observe as your opponents ask and answer questions, and one by one you figure out who can't be the murderer, so that once you've eliminated all the suspects except for one, you have deduced the killer's identity. The board and the cards are both there to support the game's essential play pattern, moving your piece around from room to room, making suppositions and crossing suspects off your list in a race to solve the puzzle before the other players do. Now the components support that play pattern, but it's the pattern that makes the game what it is, not the components. And that's why it makes sense to categorize Clue not as a board game or as a card game, but as a deduction game. When we define categories of games like this by play patterns, we can get much more useful information about what people like and don't like, and we can use that information much more effectively to be able to predict which kinds of games we should recommend to suit a particular person's tastes. Remember, every game's fun for some people and not so much fun for other people, so it's no use just recommending the one that's the most fun, because that's going to be subjective, and fun is incredibly hard to define. <laughs> 
much harder than to define the board game or card game, I think. For example, supposing you've got somebody at your table and you know that they're a fan of poker. Now, poker is a game of betting and bluffing, and yes, you do play it with cards, but it doesn't really have much of the same appeal elements as other card games, like, say, Hearts or Bridge or Klondike Solitaire or Crazy Eights. Though it does have a fair bit in common with other betting games like Manila or Camel Up. Consider Rising Sun which is this big, sprawling, complicated board game with dozens of little plastic figures that you move around fighting each other, taking over territory. And battles in this game require players to secretly decide how to spend their money on certain key aspects of their battle plan. And then they reveal their secret plans, and only then do we see who's actually won the battle. Poker kind of actually has more in common with Rising Sun than it has in common with Bridge even though you do play bridge with the same 52 card deck that you would use for a poker game. So if we're going to talk about our tastes and preferences in games, it's not that helpful to say something like, I prefer board games over card games, because that could mean almost anything. It's much more descriptive to say something like, um, I like Euro games, especially worker placement games, but I don't really like auction or area control games. Except there's one slight problem, and that is that the vast majority of the people out there in the world absolutely no idea what on earth I just said. <laughs> and there's a few enthusiasts out there who get it, but most of them already know what they like in games, and they probably don't have a lot of trouble articulating it. If you want to approach somebody who's new to the hobby and curious to explore, it's not helpful to throw a bunch of jargon at them. You have to meet them where they are, and you want to be listening to them, not bombarding them with so many questions that they start to feel attacked or unwelcome. I've been guilty of that way too many times, and it just breaks my heart to wonder how many people I might have driven away from games by delivering some kind of lecture on game design like I just did a minute ago, instead of you know, just making the effort to try to understand what people really mean when they use the terms that they're familiar with, even if those terms can be kind of imprecise. So let's take a closer look at what people who might not have access to all this rarefied technical vocabulary might be talking about when they refer to a card game or a board game. Now, obviously I can't read minds, so I can't know for sure what anybody's thinking when they refer to these categories, and obviously it's going to vary from one person to another, but let's try anyway and see what we can do. We'll start with an example that I used to get all the time working at the cafe. Suppose we get a person who says, I don't want to play something that's like a card game. What are they telling you when they say that? What is the common perception of card games in this part of the world, North America in my case? Well, they're probably talking about games you play with a standard 52 card deck with hearts and spades and clubs and diamonds, right? Yes, Coloretto is a card game, and Magic the Gathering is a card game, and Pit is a card game, and those don't have spades and clubs in them, it's true. But when somebody says that they don't want to play something that's like a card game, they probably aren't talking about those kinds of cards, they're talking about these kinds of cards. And what do these games have in common with each other? Well, they're mostly pretty old games, like 19th century or earlier. They're mostly family games or kids games, like Go Fish or Old Maid. A lot of them have kind of obtuse rules that are simple once you know them, but they're kind of hard to pick up when you're just starting out. I mean, poker is pretty simple compared to something like Rising Sun, but it's not the easiest game to learn if you've never played anything like it before. Even a simpler card game like Euchre has a lot to explain, and it's not exactly intuitive. You're going to have to explain how trick-taking works for a start, if there's anybody at the table who hasn't played a trick-taking game before, which means you're also going to have to explain what it means to follow suit, or what reneging means. You're going to have to explain what the left and right bower are. You're going to have to explain how to work with your partner or go it alone. You have to explain how the scoring works and how the bidding works, and that's before they can even start to think about which card they ought to be playing in any given situation. And let's remember, the components that you use to play these games are no help at all. None of the rules are printed on any of these cards themselves. There's no player aid, there's no reminder text. You just have to keep it all memorized all the time in your head. So. You start to see the pattern here, right? With the exception of the really juvenile games like War or Old Maid or Go Fish, traditional card games played with that 52 card deck tend to be obscure, unintuitive, and frustrating to new players, even though they're often extremely relaxing and easy for people who've been playing them for years. 
And if you've ever tried to actually explain a card game that you thought was easy to someone who's never played anything like it before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So if I'm trying to figure out what to recommend to somebody who has told me I don't like card games, what I hear from that usually amounts to either I don't want something that's going to frustrate me with a steep learning curve, or I don't want something that's too simple and too juvenile to appeal to a typical adult audience. Now there are plenty of modern card games like, say, Coloretto or No Thanks that can actually work just fine for people like that, and if they like games with similar play patterns, then they probably actually have a really good time playing those. Maybe even they'd find a new favorite game. If I could convince them to give it a try, and considering that they just finished saying that they don't want a card game, they might not feel terribly inclined to indulge me in that particular idea. They might even come to the understandable conclusion that I must not be listening to them. So instead, what I'd actually do is bring them a game that not only has something other than cards at the center of it, but also has some kind of simple, intuitive set of rules. As it happens, most of the dice games that I talked about a couple of videos ago should actually be a pretty good fit for that. Alright, what if they say they don't particularly like board games? Well, they could be referring to tabletop games generally, or they might be referring to games that they've had a lot of experience with playing in the past. And the most popular games out there, at least in this part of the world, are Monopoly and Risk. So what do those two games have in common? Well, for one thing, they're really, really long, like way longer by hours than even the heaviest, most complicated modern board games. Except and, Twilight Imperium. Um, I think you can play Twilight Imperium two or three times in the time it takes to play Monopoly once. I'm pretty sure. No. Twelve hours. Both I, I think it just feels that way. Isn't Twelve it's, hours. It's both. Twelve million hours. And. They both eliminate players one at a time, leaving them with absolutely nothing to do but sit there and watch while everybody else finishes the game, which could go on for hours. Also like Twilight Imperium. For example. Now, that might not be a lot to go on, so you might actually have to ask them what they mean by I don't like board games. And I don't know about you, but it's been my experience that the question, what do you mean, is likely to elicit a lot of anxiety in people. Um, you can soften the blow, a little bit at least, by asking them to tell you which board games they hate the most. People seem to be more open about what they hate for some reason. And if they say Risk and Monopoly, okay, you've got a fairly good idea of what you're talking, what they're talking about, and what you need to avoid, and honestly, just about any board game that was designed and published this century should actually be able to avoid the problems of those two titles without a lot of difficulty. I'd recommend sticking with modern introductory classics like Ticket to Ride, Takaido, or my favorite introductory game, Century Spice Road. That one actually doesn't have a board, so it can be a really good one to bring to the table for new players who express a distaste for board games. Ticket to Ride does have a board, and that board does happen to be a map, which can be pretty off-putting for people who have had seriously negative experiences playing Risk. But once you explain to them that it's not actually so much a board game as a set collecting game like Rummy, where you're supposed to collect cards that are all the same color and then put them down to score points, that usually helps them through their initial misgivings. And once they see those cute little plastic trains, well. And as for Takaido, I mean, it's just so pretty. I mean, all you really have to do is just show that board and tell your friends that this is a game of competitive nice day having. And that pretty much ought to do it. The wow factor of modern board game components and their visual design can do a lot to draw people in who would otherwise be reluctant to try them. Card games usually tend to be a little bit less splashy on first impression, they don't have quite as many fancy components, so they can be a tougher sell. But on the other hand, if you ask someone what board games they hate the most and their answer is chess, well then maybe what you need is more narrative, more of a story in the games you recommend to them. And for a lot of people, a lot of board games can seem kind of dry and abstract on first impression. So for somebody who's accustomed to role-playing games, whether it's tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons, or electronic RPGs like the Mass Effect series, or adventure games like The Legend of Zelda, 
You're going to need something with a coherent narrative, something with characters that these players can root for, and a story that they can follow, as well as ways that they can steer that story in directions that are interesting to them. Now, it's also possible that they're not really comfortable with adversarial games that pit players against one another, and that they would prefer something more like a cooperative game, where players have to work together to accomplish a common goal. Fortunately, we live in a day and age when amazing co-op games seem to be falling out of the trees. Uh, cooperative games are in fashion these days, and there are a lot of great titles to choose from. Of course, there's the ever-popular Pandemic, but there's also the similar but easier to learn Forbidden Island. There's the extremely demanding but richly rewarding Gloomhaven, and the wonderfully silly A Touch of Evil, which I'm a big fan of. The list goes on and on. We will definitely be covering some of these titles in, in more depth in future videos on this channel, so please do stay tuned. But in the meanwhile, I hope that this video has helped to give you a clearer sense of what kinds of games you like or don't like, and also a sense of why you feel that way. Again, I kind of feel like most of the people I've helped at the cafe really have not seemed to feel comfortable talking about or maybe even thinking about what it is that makes a game fun for them. Um, especially when I kind of, sort of, gave them the third degree about it. I'm really sorry about that. So, if you're feeling maybe a bit weird right now, kind of like you're being psychoanalyzed by a stranger, I swear I am not judging you for it, and I do hope that you'll stick around for future videos because you're a big part of what we want to do with this channel. We want to help people just like you to get more familiar with and more comfortable with talking and thinking about these things. I mean, I don't know who you are, but I do know that you deserve to enjoy your time playing games. I know that these things can be intimidating at first, but as you start to build up your vocabulary and your familiarity with these different kinds of games that are out there, I promise you, it will get easier, and it will get a lot more fun. Well, you're here to help people. I'm here to crack jokes. Mm, that helps, too. <laughs> and for those of you out there who already know this stuff and have struggled to find just that right game to introduce your other friends and family to the kinds of games that you like best, I hope that this has given you a bit of a window into the world of people who are still new to all of this. And don't forget, we were all new here once, and the more we learned, the more fun it became. I think we need to use our knowledge and our experience to make it easier for more people to play, because the whole world of games gets better when more people are having a good time here. If we're going to be the gatekeepers of this hobby, then I say we throw those gates wide open and invite the whole world in to join us. Thank you so much for watching. This channel is supported by Patreon. You can also hire me to help you make the most of your game nights at joanthegamesmistress.com. If you can't afford any of that, please keep tuning in. Uh, you can still help me out with a like sub ding for free, and you can also help me out by telling me in the comments what you mean when you're referring to a board game or a card game. Don't forget though, mean comments get deleted and mean people get banned, so play nice. Your turn. I like the thingy. Wait, is this, are we still recording? Yeah.